Hi, I'm Brian Freer, tutoring high school biology. Today's topic is cellular respiration. All cells need energy, and they get it from ATP. Of course, then the question is, where does ATP come from? Look on the most ingredients list, you won't find it. It's made from glucose, a sugar your body can make out of pretty much anything you put in your mouth. Well, anything edible that you can put in your mouth. The process by which glucose is converted to ATP is known as cellular respiration and occurs in three stages. Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transfer chain. We're going to go through those right now. In glycolysis, you start out with glucose, a six-carbon molecule, and you convert it into two pyruvic acids. Each pyruvic acid has three carbons in it. It's kind of like breaking glucose in half. Glycolysis also produces two ATP and two NADH. Now, you may be wondering where those came from. Well, there's a bunch of this molecule, NAD+, that's floating around the cell. It's not really doing too much until it gets converted to NADH. See, all the energy in glucose is storing these high-energy electrons. In glycolysis, two pairs of high-energy electrons are pulled off of glucose and given to NAD+. This creates two NADH. All NADH does is hold on to those electrons. We'll see them later in the electron transport chain. As for the ATP, think of it as a rechargeable battery. There's a bunch of ADP that's floating around the cell. That's like the uncharged state. You put in some energy in a phosphate group and you get ATP, the charged state, ready to go, ready to be used for energy. Alright, now ordinarily you would move on into the Krebs cycle, but if you don't have enough oxygen, you'll instead move on into fermentation, also known as anaerobic respiration, if you will, respiration without air. In this, two pyruvic acids that you just made and the two NADH that you also just made get converted into two lactic acids and two ATP. This is very inefficient and painful. Two ATP is not that much. And as for lactic acid, if you start exercising really hard, you'll start to feel a burn. That's lactic acid buildup. That's because you can't get enough oxygen to your muscles in time. However, if you could get enough oxygen to your muscles in time, you would go into the Krebs cycle. You start out with pyruvic acid, a three carbon molecule, and you remove one of those carbons and bond it to oxygen, creating CO2. That's where the oxygen comes in. This also produces an NADH. This two carbon molecule now enters the Krebs cycle and fuses with the four carbon molecule that's still spinning around. This produces a six carbon molecule, citric acid. A carbon is then lost as O2 to create CO2, and another NADH is formed. This brings us to a five carbon molecule. Now we're going to flick off another carbon to O2 to create CO2. This also produces an NADH and an ATP. Score! Now we have a four carbon molecule. Fusing it with the two carbon molecule coming into the Krebs cycle will produce an FADH2 and an NADH. Don't worry too much about FADH2. It's an electron carrier, just like NADH. It'll hold on to high energy electrons until the electron transport chain. Now before we move on, I'd just like to note one thing. I've written out some numbers here for what's produced during the Krebs cycle. Three carbon dioxide, four NADH, one FADH2, and one ATP. These numbers should be double, because as you can see, this Krebs cycle run uses only one pyruvic acid, but glycolysis produces two. You'll see those numbers appear later in the electron transport chain or rather, right now, the electron transport chain. You might recognize this as the cell membrane. Well, it's not exactly the cell membrane. It is a membrane, but it's the one found in mitochondria. You may have noticed that squiggly line inside mitochondria when people draw it. That's a second membrane, and that's what we're looking at right now. The structure, however, is similar to the cell membrane. These blobs represent proteins embedded in the membrane, and this particularly specially shaped blob represents a protein known as ATP synthase. We'll get there in a minute. Okay, so remember all those electron carriers we had, NADH and FADH2? This is where they come in. They will donate the electrons they've been holding on to to these proteins. Now, the environment of the mitochondria has a bunch of H plus ions floating around. They're charged, hence the plus, and so they can't move through the membrane. Remember, membranes do not allow charged or polar atoms or molecules to move through. Instead, they'll have to go across protein channels, and that's just what the electron transport chain does. The electron is then moved on to the next protein, which releases energy and causes H plus to diffuse across. This will happen again and again and again. The electron transport chain is much longer than just three proteins. And every time, H plus will diffuse across. At the very end of the electron transport chain, it, the electron will meet up with four H pluses and an O2 to create two H2O molecules. But anyway, as the electron transport chain continues, H plus will move from the outside of the membrane 
the inside. There will be a very high concentration of H plus ions on this side and a very low concentration here. As you know about diffusion, th things want to diffuse across and make the concentrations equal, but they can't because the membrane will not let polar or charged molecules through. That's where ATP synthase comes in. ATP synthase provides a bridge for the H plus to travel over in a process known as chemiosmosis. The H plus will travel back across the membrane, equalizing the concentration again. But in doing so, they will go through ATP synthase, which turns something like a mill inside the ATP synthase to make ADP become ATP. And this is all made out of the energy that we had stored up in NADH and FADH. And now we can start looking at the totals. Glycolysis produced two ATP right off the bat. It also produced two NADH. These NADH went into the electron transport chain, and their electrons produced another four ATP. As for the Krebs cycle, that produced two ATP from the two pyruvic acids we have. It also produced another eight NADH and another 2 FADH2. The 8 NADH produced 24 ATP, and the FADH2 produced another 4 ATP. Now we can look up the totals. Adding this all up, we'll get 36 ATP. And that's the total ATP yield from cellular respiration. To recap, Cellular respiration creates ATP from glucose. In glycolysis, we break glucose apart to create two pyruvic acids, two ATP, and two NADH. ATP is the energy of the cell use. NADH just holds on to electrons until the electron transport chain. If you don't have enough oxygen, you'll go through fermentation, which produces two lactic acid and two ATP from the pyruvic acid and NADH you've just made. Lactic acid causes a burn. If you have enough oxygen, you'll go into the Krebs cycle. Pyruvic acid is converted to a two-carbon molecule fused with the 4-carbon molecule inside the Krebs cycle to a 6-carbon molecule, drop to 5, drop to 4, and it repeats. This will produce 3 CO2, 4 NADH, 1 FADH2, which is just an electron carrier like NADH, and 1 ATP. You'll have to double these numbers because the Krebs cycle runs for only one pyruvic acid, but you produce two in glycolysis. All the NADH and FADH2 you've so far created will go into the electron transport chain and donate their electrons. The movement of electrons releases their energy and moves H plus ions across the membrane in mitochondria. This creates a strong gradient of H plus on this side, so they'll diffuse through ATP synthase to make the gradients equal again. Doing so produces ATP from ADP, for a grand total of 36 ATP for throughout cellular respiration. Alright, that's all for now. Again, I'm Brian Freer. See you next time.